Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's a uh, truly a wonderful time to get together and really discuss technology and really discuss uh, all everything that's actually happening with the industry. But one of the one of the biggest uh, drivers of industry right now is really smart cities and the application that runs on smart cities. This, this is the buzzword that uh, a buzzword that a lot of people are actually talking about. But we know very well that there's always key components or there's always uh, things that we need to consider to actually make sure that um, you know a, the smart cities actually work. And so uh, today we actually have in our panel uh, a group that has over a hundred years, I guess, of, of industry experience. And of course we have Keith Pinacho, who's the chief strategy officer and uh, uh, executive vice president for Squan. And we also have Walter Cannon, who is the vice president of business development for Zenfi. And of course, Alex Gamoro, who is the senior vice president and general manager for Big Belly. Uh, I'm Noel Garcia. I'm actually the vice president of operations in uh, Advantage Engineers for the East Coast. Okay, with for, without further ado, I think we, we need to dive in and ask really the, the first question. And that is, truly, uh, we say that uh, space, connectivity, and power are the key ingredients of a smart city deployment. Why is that? Uh, Alex, maybe we can start with you and say, okay, what, 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 what is one of the key ingredients and why is it a key ingredient? Sure. And uh, first off, I want to uh, thank uh, Alyssa, Patty, and the other folks at NEDAS uh, for in putting this on and, and inviting me and it's an exciting uh, topic near and dear to, to my heart. Um, I've been in the industry a little over 20 years. So I guess, uh, Walter and Keith, uh, you make up the balance there to get to over 100. I, we're all old, but uh, maybe some are more than, than others. Uh, anyhow, exciting topic. Um, and, and so I think if you step back and you think about smart city and you think about all the great applications that, uh, that are out there, and community leaders, business leaders, um, they always think about the apps. Well, all those great apps, or the majority of them, actually need equipment that's nearby that enables them to run uh, effectively. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, Waze or Uber, uh, these are just two examples of these sort of information communication technology applications that rely on having equipment that's nearby. So if you need equipment that's, that's nearby, and as you think about you know, 4G into 5G, particularly millimeter wave, as well as even uh, unlicensed spectrum, you realize that you need a place to put this equipment. You need an antenna that essentially is never gonna leave. And that antenna needs to be connected to a box and the box is either a processor, a radio, and that, 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 that box or that piece of equipment needs to have power and, uh, and, and most likely needs to have fiber uh, connected to it as well. So space certainly becomes a constraint when you think about the uh, urban environments or public spaces um, because the, the constraining item on it is aesthetics um, as well as just physical space. Um, and, uh, you know, I think not to have the whole conversation right here, but uh, you know, part of why I, I, I transitioned from my last company, um, a you know, large tower company, to Big Belly was because I believed, and, and I think we're seeing it play out, that there's a there's a finite amount of space in the public space, and it's really about being creative and innovative about maybe uh, reusing, adapting. Um, hiding in plain sight uh, with all that equipment. Yeah, definitely, Alex. That's that's definitely one of the key components, right? As we all say, there's limited street furniture, and if you want to get closer to the users, you have to reuse areas where it's already existing. That makes it a lot easier. But nevertheless, space <clears throat> will always be a critical component to that. Now, aside from that, uh, connectivity is another one. And Walter, I know from Zenfi Networks, you you guys build a lot of fiber. So, what does connectivity mean in terms of it being a critical component to smart cities? 
No, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I think, it, you know, here at Zenfine Networks, we actually deliver solutions that encompass uh, both space, power, and connectivity. Uh, I think the most important point is that without, if we had not built the solutions that we built and, and continue to build solutions and continue to, to work with governments and municipalities to have more siting areas, whether it be smart street uh, furniture like Big Belly or poles or smart poles, that's that's really important in uh, being able to deliver the solutions. Just think about where we would be um, as a nation if we had not had built the infrastructure we built prior to the pandemic. And from a connectivity perspective, um, <clears throat> there's always a challenge. And the biggest challenge is, is being able to get to those other items, whether it be the space for siting from a siting or delivering the power and then having the right amount of fiber. And then last but not least, and probably the most important is being able to know where your fiber is and where it's going. So, you know, in some instances other than, and what we've built in, in our networks across the New York, New, New Jersey area, um, you know, we built over 1300 route miles of fiber, very integral, um, not complicated, but accessible, adaptable cable uh, con conduit system that allows us to interrupt our cables wherever we, uh, wherever we need to be to surpassing um, any manhole. So it's really important to be able to be accessible and be able to deliver solutions that can help um, provide the people that build uh, solutions on top of us. Because remember, we're just providing the infrastructure. We're like sort of the bottom of the Lego blocks. You know, we're providing the Lego blocks at the at the at the bottom, a very foundation that people can build. Some some of those being all the major carriers, enterprise, wholesale telecom providers, WISP, whoever they may be. Okay, great, Walter. And 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 truly, all of this equipment uh, needs to have connectivity, right? Uh, it, it definitely needs space, but definitely needs connectivity. And and you brought up a good point that. Uh, there, there is some challenges to it. And we'll talk to that uh, in, in a little bit later. But aside from space and connectivity, of course, there's always going to be power that is required. And Keith, if you don't mind, can you can you expound a little bit more on why power? Sure. So so picking up on where Walter uh, and Alex left off, you know, as we look to uh, network architecture and the deployment of infrastructure, you know, Squan originally started out as a wireless construction firm, right? And we've grown over the years by uh, incorporating other companies that we acquired uh, over time to augment what we're already providing to our customer base. But what we saw early on is that, you know, as we as we look uh, towards the horizon at, at smart cities, you know, there's a number of different services that are, are needed in order to make that a reality. So. You know, underpinning a lot of the discussion here, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, coordination of power in our wireless business, and we started to see uh, pole attachments uh, that uh, manifested in, in many communities, uh, in some cases on power utility poles, uh, we saw it as an, an angle that if we were involved in the power business itself, it would help expedite a lot of the activity across our various projects. Now, you know, on the on the broader scene, you know, when we look at how uh, these designs come about, whether they're developed uh, initially by uh, the municipalities themselves or the network operators, uh, power is is critical to all of it. Right. And, you know, when you start looking at the uh, the early developments and I harken back to my days in Puerto Rico, building the Suncom network where you know, more than half of the network at one point was on generator power, right? Uh, today, you know, there, there's not that option, especially as you get into uh, dense urban areas where you're really going to need a uh, dedicated power source. You know, there's, of course, battery backup scenarios. There's also uh, remote uh, generators that uh, are maybe not in the, in the line of sight. Uh, partnerships with other infrastructure companies that may have uh, gen sets uh, to bridge gaps. 
But powers, you know, move right to the front of the line, you know, insofar as what is required when you're contemplating uh, deploying these networks. And if it's not contemplated on the front end, uh, you could almost be assured that the, uh, the the demo and rebuild is is somewhere not too far away. Um, so yeah, we, we place a, a, a great emphasis on how we look at where power fits into the mold, uh, especially when you start to look at densifying uh, cities and densifying networks, uh, utilizing existing infrastructure. It's complicated, but necessary. Definitely. Uh, and again, you know, any equipment that we actually have requires power, right? <laughs> and the question really is, where is that power coming from? It's the same thing as connectivity. Where is that connectivity coming from? Uh, and then going all the way to where the box is, everything needs to get together, come together to actually b bring out the site. Mm -hmm. um, one question though, guys, is we know that we actually need all of those, but what challenges are we actually seeing practically when we're trying to deploy smart cities? Are there uh, larger uh, challenges that, that comes our way uh, for, 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 for a better deployment? No, for sure. Uh, no, I'll, I'll take a, the first crack here. Um, and, and again, I mean, if you think about smart city, uh, but before I, I pivot to talk about uh, cellular, uh, e even the, the core big belly product um, has those two issues, or sorry, the three issues of space, power, and, and connectivity. And the way that the, the folks who um, you know, worked on the, the product uh, early on, because it's, it's a 15 year old company, uh, global presence was to go the route of, of solar for the power. And uh, a lot of our IPs around energy management, uh, which then drives, you know, the smarts associated with our core smart waste solution, uh, both a compactor, and then we have a, uh, a SIM card that communicates back to the cloud to allow the, the city or the, uh, the facilities department or whoever the property owner is to be able to use this, this solution, the smart city solution in this way. Now that's fine if you're thinking about low power, low data types of smart city solutions and certainly for you know, smart meters or smart lighting these kinds of approaches can can work well. Once you start getting into, I think, the realm of really what the I think the meat of our conversation is, that's when you start needing to have you know grid power and and and, and fiber. And so, given the lack of space or aesthetics, um, and, and Keith, similarly, you know, in my background, I you know did a lot of work with utility poles and, and, and streetlight attachments. But at a certain point, you run out. Um, and you know you need to look at things like kiosks or bus shelters, or in the case of Big Belly, where we have uh, a presence in you know over 50 countries, 25,000 unique locations in the U.S. alone with that core product. How can you modify it, adapt it, as Walter was saying, so that you can start actually supporting a lot of other types of, of uses? So uh, I know that we all agreed that we weren't going to do PowerPoint to death, but there is one slide that I wanted to show because I think it's the natural progression of, of what we're talking about, which is creating this, um, this multi-network, multi-purpose uh, platform that handles multiple different things. Um, and by doing so, it, it actually addresses you know, costs with power and costs with connectivity. And again, this would be more grid power and, and bringing um, you know, fiber to the location. Um, this is a one uh, campus, uh, you know, if you, if you know the Big Belly product, you know that we're on, um, you know, uh, hundreds of campuses um, and they love their, their, their Big Belly smart waste and, and recycling for all, all, the, all the, the right reasons, I'll say, you know, sustainability, uh, aesthetics, uh, uh, beautification. Now that they have that space being utilized by the smart waste and the recycle, they also know that they need to have some sort of asset to handle the cellular networks, 
they also have their own private networks that they're thinking about. So in this instance here on the left, what you're seeing is a, you know, um, a 30 foot uh, tall pole with a canister antenna at the top, 5G millimeter wave beneath that, that's all for uh, the carrier. Uh, but then you see a campus CBRS, campus Wi-Fi, campus uh, banners. Um, in this arrangement, um, power, fiber, uh, there's a business arrangement that, that, that works for everyone. And, and it's cheaper than making if it's cheaper than if this was a single purpose location. Um, also, given this location that they have a lot of underground issues, it, it really is able to spread those costs of the power of the fiber uh, against many different uh, use cases. So, you know, there's almost a spectrum of, OK, how much power, how much data do you need? And maybe some smart city deployments like our core product can be fine being off grid. Maybe even it's a, a millimeter wave repeater. But when you start thinking about all the possibilities and applications that need the, the cellular network, 4G, 5G, CBRS, Wi-Fi, lights, cameras, all those things, then you, you really need to be thinking about almost a Swiss army knife approach. I mean, I liked Walter's Lego bricks, um, but what we feel like is a lot of times we talk to um, our customers and our customers are kind of a broad group. It's what else can you put there? Well, how else can we utilize that space most effectively? Okay, and, and, and thanks Alex for, for sharing this because truly aesthetics is, is definitely something that's being considered. I know a lot of cities uh, you know, are very particular on, on how a lot of the structures look like. Um, so Walter, what other challenges do you actually see? Uh, and in fact, we, we said consolidation of a lot of the technology that goes into uh, a single node or a single site. How much fiber is really needed then to actually go into one of these locations? So um, uh, let me try to answer your question and, and from another perspective, because I think the, the whole um, Zenfi Networks as a digital infrastructure provider um, and trying to enable the creation of smart cities and bring, um, you know, some realistic you know, bring everything into reality is has a lot of different challenges challenges. So that's what I would like to address. You know, when we talk about fiber, I think you're never going to have enough fiber. You know, every people are, tr are trying to solve the issues of connectivity, thinking that they're going to add, you know, um, some type of uh, wireless connectivity and others. But if you look at all the different architectures that are, that are becoming prevalent and becoming in use, not just here in America, uh, throughout the Europe and Asia, in, including stuff, um, if you're familiar with ORAN, Open RAN, um, and others, it's, it's an apparent that we're going to need a, a really more access to not just fiber, but siting and power and, and, and distributed power. Um, I think what we have now, uh, to be quite frank, in my opinion, is that we have some some people are making um, governments making a good effort to address the issue by funding, and funding might be, hey, build more fiber. But they're not really seeing the whole picture of what encompasses digital infrastructure, and they don't understand the architecture behind different digital inf infrastructure. So you run into issues. That might be at the municipality with land use. Um, someone said it earlier that you run out of poles. Well, no, you really don't run out of poles. What you run out with, out of is the ability to put more poles. Because I think if you ask any, if you ask Zenfi Networks, we would love to put up more poles. <laughs> we would love to put up more siting devices, but we, it's a land use issue that I have to go wait, you know, through X amount of months to get approved to do this. So that's the problem. Um, then it, 
Then the other issue that I think that, and it's a big issue when you're talking about trying to solve one of the biggest problems we have here in America from a technology perspective is, is closing the digital divide is, you know, think about the days when they first wanted to distribute electricity and what it took to do that. They thought about it and they built these central offices and they distribute, distribute our cable. And then in front of a building, they had the cable ready to bring it in to source the building. But if the, if the person that owned the building had not put in the right cabling to support it, then you wouldn't be able to bring in the power and their residents would have been without power. Now imagine now relating that to where we are today and the need for digital infrastructure throughout, not just in the streets and do, cause we can do that today under most of the guidelines and everything that's out there. But think about having to be able to do that in the building and maybe directing funding towards that. So that could be an issue. So if you ask me, the, my answer to the question would be, um, and we strive to do this on a daily basis as Infine Networks is building a more cohesive relationship with municipalities and government that they understand what the what the true requirements are from different digital infrastructure providers like Zenfi. Uh, we all, I believe, are, are very used to putting our capital to work and building solutions that better the community. There's millions of studies that are out there that show that um, how this technology has better the community, increase the G GDP, and increase the more <laughs> Builds more revenue base inside inside your municipality. So I think the the argument has to be is um, how, how we can better continue to build this uh, build and make that type of relationship better is is a lot of the, the challenges that we have today. Great, Walter. How about you, Keith? Any any opinion on your end? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll say the missing word uh, that's out there is collaboration, right? I think uh, we all hinted around uh, the word and in, uh, in varying ways. You know, I I, I look at, at at time past, and you know, Walter and I have been on uh, panels in the past, as I've been on many of my own uh, related to smart cities, and I I look at you know the the constant issue that arises is stemmed in miscommunication or lack of consideration for planning uh, across multiple technologies and applications. And I, you know, I still think there's room out there for somebody uh, and, and, you know, we, 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 we move that direction, but there's so many moving parts. You know, the example that Walter gave about having the cable in the right place at the right time, or the example that Alex pointed out where you see the different uh, technologies deployed, you know, those are, those are in a lot of cases in silos, right? And the conversations don't happen unless you've got somebody who's able to communicate across all of those lines, provide options for plug and play, because where, where you may have a lek in certain areas, you may have a power company that supports certain areas. You may have gaps in there as well. You know, we, we've seen, uh, other groups uh, come into play through third-party money and and invest in some of that infrastructure on their own to bridge those gaps that some individual uh, network operators were, were unable to do, whether it's uh, due to capital constraints on their own uh, budgets annually or uh, their their lack of willingness to to build in a certain area, you know, and that creates opportunities for yeah. everybody. But I'll, I'll stress, I mean, it, it's collaboration, it's understanding the landscape understanding where the gaps are in that landscape and articulating a path that is incorporating of all those items, you know, and I'll, I'll use uh, the example that Alex gave earlier about uh, bus, bus stops and shelters. You know, I'm forever amazed that the number of RFPs that get issued by a city for telecom infrastructure or use of telecom infrastructure that does not take into account uh, some of those properties. You know, in a lot of respects, they'll they'll ask for somebody to come in and do a uh, a third party audit of what assets they have, most of which are are poorly represented in their in their own data because of the cycles of uh, 
the uh, the administration, whoever may be in office at that time. But it's you know collaboration cannot be underestimated when you're when you're contemplating all of this, and you really need to take into account you know not not just the technology, but the power and and even the the downstream uh, execution because we all hear autonomously driving vehicles like off in off in the periphery, right? And there's you know there's certainly camps on who uh, is leading the charge in do I do I need a connected network or how am I connecting that car, right? What are the safety uh, restrictions? Am I using uh, intersection lights, right? Do I have the power to support some of that radio technology I'm deploying? It, it's, you know, forums like this fortunately provide uh, a bit of insight into how, uh, you know, we think of these types of networks. But again, I'll I'll hang my hat on collaboration all day long. And, and as, as I like to say, I, I talk to everybody on a routine basis. And it's really the only way to shape a path forward that's inclusive. You, Thank you, know, you for that. No, if I could jump in. Sure. No, if I could just jump in, you know, um, uh, piggyback on what Keith was saying. He, he's he's 100 percent correct. I mean, we could get into, you know, the. The, the the idea of smart cities and the the reality of whether smart cities are actually going to be a thing or we're going to call it something else later. Um, but at the end of the day, there's some issues that cost is is really a, a big issue and it continues to be a big issue and something that the the people that want smart cities should think about and through collaboration they could understand what the parameters are around that. But there's other ways to um, uh, uh, dissuade the cost by um, having the ability to build more solutions on top of the correct digital infrastructure. So if you look at the correct di digital infrastructure of space power and connectivity as building being the building blocks to deliver um, the right so solutions in smart cities, um, that's the way to look at it. And I'll end you with just one thing that I think about a lot. If inside of 5G, there's two very big features that's waiting to be um, utilized and exploited by the major carriers out, of, out there. And that would be the ability to deliver network slicing and um, solutions and ATS3, you know, ATSSS, which would be, which is where 5G and Wi-Fi converge so that if I'm talking on my Wi-Fi call, if I'm a tenant, a young kid, a tenant doing his homework in the, in the NYCHA projects, and he's doing it on a tablet over Wi-Fi, and he's also can get connected to the, one of the lifeline programs from uh, from T-Mobile or whoever, so he walks outside of his house, but he's still on his tablet doing his homework. He never drops the car. Imagine that. But that's <laughs> these are the type of applications. These are different applications. There's more applications coming that we never ever heard about. Mm -hmm. But imagine if you had the right digital infrastructure to support that. So I would challenge everyone including Zenfi, to continue to have more collaborative talks with all the constituents involved in this unique economy and this unique world that we live in. Yeah, and and and, and we're running out of time, but let, let me summarize everything that we've spoken about. So truly, uh, smart cities, the, the, the three ingredients is really space, connectivity, and power. But we are all saying that it requires collaboration between the carriers, the municipalities, or the jurisdictions, and everyone else involved in the deployment to make sure that there is a successful deployment of smart cities and a massive deployment of smart cities everywhere. So again, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the panelists and uh, thank you. Yeah, stand thank by you. though, um, you know, cause we do have a, a question from our audience. Um, and this one's for you, Alex, um, for Big Belly. Uh, does Big Belly still have agreements with the traditional trash removal companies where it prohibits a town or city, et cetera, to purchase and deploy uh, their Big Belly wireless trash can? Uh, I, I don't believe so. Uh, I mean, it's sort of a, a vague question. I'm not aware that such a thing uh, exists, but if you want to take it offline, I, I can certainly follow up about it. But it, right. as far as I'm, as I'm aware, it shouldn't be a, uh, a, a, a prohibit uh, to go forward. 
Excellent. Well, thank you for addressing that. And thank you all for such a great conversation.